This is Jaw News Prime. Indeed, this is Joy News Prime. Welcome to two hours of comprehensive and compelling news content on Joy News Prime. It's a compilation of local foreign business, sports, entertainment, plus the interactive segment. My name is Aisha Brian. Ahead of the bulletin tonight, Industrial and Commercial Workers Union and Ghana Agricultural Workers Union accused Chief Executive Officer of Ghana Cocoa Board for engaging in acts that undermine the industry and leading to loss of money. Unemployment features high on the agenda of Clotic Kole constituents as a joy ballot box affords them the opportunity to hear from their prospective parliamentary candidates. Meanwhile, today marked the end of day two of the limited voter registration exercise as an NDC agent is physically assaulted at Abetifi for opposing the registration of minors. And coming up in business, the latest World Bank report on commodity prices predicts crude oil prices to go up consistently in the coming months. Also, a group uh, of researchers at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology identify several fraudulent practices of food vendors in the Kumasi metropolis that pose health threats to consumers. We are also available via the ABN channel 235. My name is Sasha Brime. Let's get down to the stories now. Uh, Juniorized workers in the cocoa industry have accused Cocoa Board Chief Executive Dr. Stephen Opuni of massive corruption and dubious deals leading to the loss of millions of dollars to the state. Two unions, Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, ICU, and the General Agricultural Workers Union, GAU, at a news conference in Accra said, Cocoa Board is engaging in secret selling of the cash crop, leading to the loss of some $10 million lost uh, last year alone. Speaking at a news conference, General Secretary of GAU, Kingsling Cancer, asked President Mahama to institute an immediate probe into the activities of Cocoa Board to save the nation. Two unions, Industrial and Commercial Workers Union and the General Agricultural Workers Union of the Trades Union, accused Dr. Opuni of deliberately plotting to break the labor front at Cocoa Board so he can have his way. The unions said Dr. Opuni is earning a salary over and above any public sector chief executive in this country, including the governor of the Bank of Ghana. Thousands of tons of cuckoo are sold by the management of Cocoa Board, which is hidden from the government and for which no proper accounts are maintained either. This is known as special sample residue. The special sample residue is done by drawing an average of 0.3 kg of cocoa beans from each bag taken over and sold by the cocoa marketing company. So for every thousand tons of cocoa, they get on the average 4.6 875 tons, an equivalent of 75 bucks. Therefore, the yearly average purchase of 750,000 tons will amount to 3,515.625 tons. This would affect Ghana over $10 million as of 20, 23 February 2016, when the world market price of cocoa was $2,858 per ton, excluding premium. There is excess cocoa deliveries to purchasing factories. Excess cocoa deliveries to purchasing factories. The weighing system in the cocoa industry is not very accurate. So most of the bags of cocoa weigh more than standard sales weight of 62.5 kilograms, net of the weight of the empty sack. The unions allege that Dr. Opuni and his management have given a contract to a former employee, Harrison Idris Hassan, who is the past chairman of Cocoa Board Head Office Local Union and Supreme Consultative Council of the Cocoa Industry, to destroy the union. As a news conference jointly held by the ICU and GAU seeking to correct what they termed falsehood and deceit of workers in the cocoa industry, the unions said Idris Hassan was coercing the workers to join another illegal union with the tacit support of Dr. Opuni and the management. 
the software put in place to help account for drugs had not been operating effectively and efficiently long ago. And so huge drugs, huge drug shortages have been recorded over the past years. The vendor of the software refused to provide effective support service to ensure its smooth operations, even though he was being paid by Cocoa Board Management. It was reported to management to get the software replaced because of its ineffectiveness. This was, however, met with stiff opposition by a section of the management staff. This inaction of management suggests clearly that the state of the software is a, is a work of a syndicate established to diverting these drugs for their personal gains. This is because there is a whole manager in charge of information technology communication development responsible for ensuring that the system works efficiently. One could not understand whether the procurement of the following items were made just to make money for the numerous supply companies that are alleged to be owned by some management staff, and or just to make some kickbacks, thus taking a share of the total cost of the item procured secretly from the vendors. ICU and Gao said the question as to whether the in-house union could break away from them was a subject of litigation before a high court yet to commence. But Idris Hassan had allegedly been claiming he had already won the case. They alleged that Dr. Opuni had blatantly refused to negotiate with the accredited unions and has imposed a 20% salary increase on the workers. Meanwhile, a letter dated February 1, 2016, an address to Haruna Idrisu, Minister of Employment and Labor Relations, and copied to the Chief of Staff, which accused Dr. Opuni of creating a culture of silence in Cocoa Board through intimidation, is yet to be acted upon by the Labor Minister. Now, the Electoral Commission has suggested the wrong dates detected on voter ID cards issued to new voters are not as widespread as has been suggested on social media. The Commission says the errors were detected in only two registration centers in the Ashanti region out of 3,500 centers nationwide. Now, according to the Commission, the anomaly affected only 31 voters and has since been rectified. In a statement issued by the Commission and signed by its Deputy Chairman of Operations, Amadou Sule, noted the error occurred in only two out of the 3,500 registration centers that are in operation nationwide. The errors affected 13 and 18 applicants in the respective registration centers. Now, the Commission wishes to assure, according to the statement, the affected people that the errors will be corrected when the data is exported to the database and new cards will be issued to them. Let's stick with politics because today the Joy ballot box stopped over at one of the hottest political hotbeds of the country, the Clote Kole constituency. Now, the NPP's parliamentary candidate, lawyer Philip Addison, and the PPP's candidate, Madame Eva Loco, availed themselves to be grilled by the electorate. Evans Mensa is the moderator. We're going to him live and uh, hear what he has to tell us. Good evening to you, Evans concern to the people of this particular constituency. Some of the issues are slightly unique, like fishing and the concerns that people have about premix fuel, the politicization of it, the fact that it's become expensive, Albert motors that they can't afford, affecting their livelihoods. We've talked about uh, jobs and the key uh, problem facing a lot of the folks here, particularly the youth. Uh, we've talked a lot also about the general economy. Uh, again, people are, people's lives have been affected by this. And On air. Evans, if you can hear me, what uh, answers it, it, have it's they... It's been one of those days when, I guess, uh, people had to make up their minds. And, and if you watched it on live on television, you get a sense that people still want to make up their minds. And they want to first interact with the candidates to uh, help them do so. We had people, for example, saying, um, so if you don't tell me this, I can find somebody else who can... I mean, people in this constituency, especially in this part of the area, uh, a bit middle class, you understand what they want, and they want...
so they want to probe a bit more. Thankfully, I've been joined by the two candidates who joined us uh, for the live ballot box show. I have uh, Miss Addison to uh, my immediate right and uh, Madame Eva Loco to my immediate left. And I will start with Madame Loco, who uh, took on a lot of the questions um, uh, from myself and from the audience on everything from uh, fishing, etc. Uh, what's your impression of how it went? This engagement was live on TV, live on radio, live on, on, on online. Um, what, did you get anything from this? Well, what's your impression? Definitely. I think that most of the questions were very candid and challenging and to the point. And it forced us to come out even with some of the secrets we didn't want to share. Yeah, you talked a lot about <laughs> your own stuff you exactly want to do. Exactly. That, you know, you say it and somebody picks it up. But I think that God is our witness. And therefore, he will give us the way to implement our policies better than anybody else who is copycatting. But I think that we had a very good audience. I think that the questions from the people who use the ballot boxes were quite specific and clear. And this tells me that more and more people are thinking about issues and not about parties. And that is very, very, very healthy. Because if you don't think about the issues, you have four years of mediocre government with nothing much being improved except maybe some prestigious uh, projects that one can point their fingers at. For us, the key thing is the human being. Without the human being being empowered, without the human being having the resources that they need, without the human beings having the kind of support that they need to actually be productive, you can talk about development and have all sorts of things that you really cannot say is improving the lives of people. So I believe that this thing should continue I just ask that we make the questions more uh, specific and that we can bring on board some of the people who put the things in the board to actually ask their questions because then we know who we are talking to. I believe that today has proven that the Kole Klote people know what they want. So it's not about us, the contestants. It's about what they want and how we are going to deliver that. If we are not able to tell them how we are going to deliver, and we give them generic answers. It will be like the olden days. After 59 years, a constituency which was next to the seat of government still has poverty, still have sanitation problems, still have unemployment, still have no jobs. You know, it's, it's difficult. Poor sanitation, poor health. It cannot continue. This is the time to change and vote for the Progressive People's Party. Because we are for Ghanaians. I've always called us since 2012, Team Ghana. We are more interested in the human beings in this country than in any prestigious uh, project that will give us, quote unquote, a name or fame. We want to make sure that the average person can look after him or herself through empowerment, through good policies, through very well functioning resource institutions that have the bites to perform their own businesses, that are well resourced to do monitoring, to do evaluation, and do implementation perfectly. It is not a matter of building a hospital without nurses or doctors, or a hospital with so many nurses and doctors out of jobs. And your constituency is going to host one of exactly. the biggest, um, uh, I'm talking about the um, Ridge Hospital, it's part of your constituency. Yes. I, I, want, I want to go to your colleague uh, from the MPP, um, Mr. Addison. Mr. Addison, you expressed surprise about the fact that a lot of people said they want to look at your manifestos, but again, I mean, if you look at the demographic of this particular constituency. A lot of us who live here are middle class. We're just not w looking for someone to come and, you know, throw us around. We're looking for something very specific. So, you know, the surprise there, I mean, does it change anything for you going forward from today? No, it doesn't really. Um, this has proved to be a very useful exercise. I have learned a lot the short time we're here. I've learned quite a lot. I mean, I've learned some things I didn't know of in the one year. Somebody's going to teach you something, <laughs> one of your uh, constituents. Yes, well, we learn every day. We learn every day. So it has been a quite a useful exercise. Now, the whole purpose of government is to ensure the well-being of its citizens. That is all. The whole purpose of government is to ensure the well-being of the citizens so that a government comes into power it is supposed to do better than the previous government. It's supposed to improve the lives of the citizens. If a government fails to do that, then it has failed terribly. 
if you have a government in place and the people are suffering, their standard of living falls, then clearly there's something wrong. Because every year there has to be an improvement in the lives of the people. So we are saying that the MPP, the comes to power, is going to take off from where President Kufo left. And there's going to be improvement in the lives of the citizens. We have suggested so many areas where there are going to be changes from what the present government is doing. We're talking about pricing for utilities, pricing for petroleum and its products, improvement in agriculture and the manufacturing sector. These are not just mere talks. It's been done before and it can be done again. It just needs the commitment of the people in power to apply the resources properly. We've talked of the waste of all resources. The MPP government, the previous one, the Kufuwa, did not have these resources. Now it's there, but we have seen nothing for it. We have nothing to show for the oil. It's about time that we start using the oil to do something that will be of benefit to the people of this country. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Loco. Thank you, uh, Ms. Addison. You've stayed with us. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for also uh, joining us. Aisha, I want to take it away um, and, and continue the conversation thank on our many much, social media Evans. platforms. Thank you very much, Evans. Uh, that was Evans Smith, head of political desk with Ballot Box at the Clotty College Constituency. You're still enjoying your two hours of compelling news content. This is Tory News Prime. Welcome back to Join News Prime. Now to the rest of our stories. Ghanaian company group Indom has announced the completion of a transaction to acquire a bank in the USA. Group Indom becomes the new owner of Eleanor Service Federal Savings Bank, known simply as ISF Bank. The U.S. regulators approved the deal on Thursday. President of Group Indom, Dr. Parkwisi Indom, spoke earlier on the polls via Skype on his latest feed. I know opportunities in the U.S. just as I know opportunities in Ghana and in Africa in general. Um, and we've always thought that the African-American community in the U.S. with, with, with more than $2 billion uh, purchasing power, um, uh, well, not $2 billion of purchasing power, but actually they, they, they used to be. They used to be over 50 African-American-owned banks in America, now it's down to 19 because a number of them have failed, which means that there are several African-American communities in the U.S. that do not have banks, and therefore there's an opportunity there. So we took advantage of this uh, to go into Chicago, take a look to find a bank that we can acquire uh, and therefore create an opportunity. And this bank is a national bank which means that we can operate it and do business anywhere uh, in the U.S. in addition to Chicago uh, itself. So it provides us with an opportunity to extend our services and take advantage of the huge African-American and the general uh, banking um, population that is in the U.S. and, and, and help us to grow our technology, mm -hmm. uh, to grow our methods, uh, to learn some new things, which we can then translate into a business opportunity back home in Ghana and West Africa. Now, President John Dramani Mahama has ordered for the immediate dissolution of the WA Polytechnic Council as a result of an administrative crisis affecting the institution. Consequently, an interim management committee is to be constituted to take over the day-to-day -day administration of the institution. Now, President Mahama announced this at a ceremony to commission a remodeled ultra-modern lecture block at Sunyai Polytechnic in the Bunahafu region during his accounting to the people tour of the region. Nesta Kafu Ajoma filed this report. The ceremony was used to perform the symbolic conversion of Sunyai Polytechnic among five others in Ghana to technical universities. President Mahama said he is aware that the management crisis at the War Polytechnic had denied graduating students from receiving their certificate for the past two years. The government is going to undertake a fast track upgrade of infrastructure in these two polytechnics and also an upgrade of faculty 
through offer of scholarships to lecturers to be able to improve their qualifications in order that we can convert the remaining polytechnics as soon as possible. President John Mahama said the remodeling of the hospitality catering and institutional management lecture block is a step towards the conversion of Sunyai Polytechnic into a technical university. He stated that Sunyai, Akrabal, Gatanga and Wa Polytechnics will benefit from phase three of installation of the amateur laboratory equipment, which will offer technical learning system in electronics, pumping systems, process management, advanced manufacturing, as well as solar and wind technology. The chief of Sunyai, Nana Busuma Aso Inkare, asks for the establishment of more technical senior high schools in the Bunohaf region, since Sunyai Polytechnic is being converted to a technical university. Vice Rector of Sunyai Polytechnic, Kwejo Edinkra, said the Polytechnic is preparing and designing programs to suit a technical university. He appealed for the construction of a footbridge across the Sunyai Kumasi Highway to prevent students from being knocked down by vehicles. Nesta Kafuya Juma's report for Joy News. Emmanuel Abuajiri, I face here with the business segment. Hey, Aisha. I know, so glamorous in thank you very Friday much. Wear. And you too. Thank very you. sweet shirts thank you have you. there. So but much. there is some bad news for us, right? Mm, well, it could be bad for you in a way, but it's good for the government. I'm thinking about myself. Of course. <laughs> already next week, the Chamber of um, Special Consumers is predicting that prices of PR is going to go up. Oh, my goodness. Yes. That's bad news. So brace for yourself us. for that. That's exactly. bad news. <laughs> All right, so time for business. And crude oil prices will be going up consistently on the international market in the coming months. That is the forecast from the World Bank in its latest report on commodity prices. George Riafe has more on the implications of this forecast on consumers of petroleum products and the government. According to the World Bank, this pickup in prices will be sustained only if there isn't too much supply of crude oil onto the international market by the oil producing countries. If this prediction is anything to go by, then the government could be smiling all night long because of the impact of this on its revenue. Government ended last year with more than 60% drop in earnings from crude oil exports, royalties and taxes to reach about $300 million. Some analysts have argued that if this trend continues, then the finance minister said Tekpe might not be forced to go to parliament again in July this year to review estimates announced in the 2016 budget. But there's another side to this development because government's import bill of crude oil could hit the roof and put a lot of pressure on its finances. However, for consumers, it's their prayer that prices do not go up because any substantial increase will result in prices of petroleum products going up significantly on the local market. This is Joy News Prime. Welcome back from that break now to the rest of our stories. And the Ghana Psychology Association has expressed worry at comments made by controversial counsellor Judge Luttrott in his presentations. Counselor Judge Luttrott in his recent comments, among others, say any lady who marry a poor man will die and go to hell. He also advised young ladies not to accept marriage proposals from poor men and national service personnel. The association described his comments as outrageous, misleading, and causing fear and panic among the public. Now, senior lecturer and public relations director for the Ghana Psychological Association, Dr. Kinsley Nyako says the association has formally written to the Ghana Psychological Council to invite him to respond to some questions. I don't even know if he's, if he's a, a psychologist. I don't know. All psychologists have been duly registered by the Ghana Psychological Council, and he is not one of us. But then the kind of things he says for me are strange. They are too just. They are unfortunate. 
and the cancer association for example uh, we have taken steps to uh, uh, write to the cancer council to uh, invite him okay uh, because what he's doing is not helping the cause of, a cause of society it's misleading the public creating tension you know uh, among friends and families which is wrong and you see the media too you want to make news but you need to get people who are competent you check their background the institution where they are they, they are affiliated to check all these things before you get on the platform other than that uh, 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 we will be uh, uh, providing services that will not help advance the cause of this society. We also have a role to play. You know, when Councillor Luther speaks, ask yourself, does his speeches benefit, unite society, or they do otherwise? All these things should guide us in determining, you know, the implication of somebody's action. So I think that we have a role to play. Why has it become necessary for the Ghana Psychological Association to write to the council to invite him? Because we think that the kind of things, one, he's not a certified psychologist. Number two, the kind of things he, he tells the public are not accurate. They are not scientifically grounded. You know, those of us in the academia, we cannot speak out of vacuum. It's not our opinions. It is what has been established empirically. So when I'm making a statement, that statement must be based on data. He is not doing that. He's not doing that. It's not about our opinion. It's about empirical data. It's about data. That's it. And has he responded to this call? Uh, I, I think we are. He's yet to, to be served. You know, our secretary has been mandated or tasked to, you know, uh, write a letter to the Ghana, Ghana Psychological Council, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure he he will contact it. You know. Yeah, so for me, I think then we... When you contact him, what exactly do you seek to achieve by bringing him to the council to respond? Oh, you know, I don't know what is going to happen, but I'm thinking uh, uh, it will depend on uh, the committee that is going to meet him. It's going to bother about, you know, our professional integrity. Okay, you call yourself a psychologist or, or, or a counselor or whatever, and you are saying things that undermine, you know, our core principles then I think, you know, there's something that you need to look at. So because of our professional integrity and, and, and also societal course, I think we, we, have, we are justified if we go in there to make sure that the right thing is done. However, describing himself as an agent of change, Councillor George Luttrott says the accusations leveled against him by the Psychological Association are mere lies. He explains that all he seeks to do is to speak the truth that has been covered by other councillors, though many of the quotes attributed to him are misquoted. I heard a lot of things he said. All the things he said, they are lies. Why? I'm lies? using that word, they are lies. Why are they lies? Has he ever listened to me before? He's not. He's reading what people are writing. He's, I have been on Joy platform, not now. Not now. I hear people say a lot of things. Most of the statement people are rewriting my quotes, it's happening at joy. From Kojo Pons Kumas time, Friday, we're having time, let's this bill, the, what do you call him, um, uh, Ebola Ray. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's, what's happening? As for late, late Night Express, it's another page. I've been, when Joy started multi, multi, multi TV, Chocolate Factory, with Vicky Yama, and came back. I've been on this platform for so many years. Where were they? So are you saying it's late in the day for them to ask you to... The question is, comments? what comments have I made that they think comes from a person who is not a professional? He claims he's appointed by God to cause change with his counseling until the prince of the world comes. You want people to change. Are you not happy when marriages are good? That's why I'm here. So block my Facebook, Facebook company. Block my Facebook, block my leg book, my rib book, my voice book, everything. But God, who called me as an agent of change, will speak even when I'm silent. Because even the video they are playing, mm. I didn't post it. I didn't know who posted it. Mm. So blocking me doesn't stop me from talking. One thing they should learn is that the prince of this world is coming. He has nothing in me. He says, George, my son, occupy till I come. I don't need credentials. What I've learned is enough. The partner of former 
EastEnders actress Sian Blake has admitted killing her and their two children. Afa Simpson, Kent's lawyer, told the Old Bailey the jury would be told this at his trial in October. He's yet to enter a formal plea. Miss Blake, 43, Zachary, 8, and Amon, 4, were found at the family home in Erith, London, in January after being reported missing on December 16. Simpson Kent was arrested at Heathrow Airport after being extradited from Ghana. The 48-year-old hairdresser is expected to enter plea on Jan July 29. Let's talk food now. Has it ever crossed your mind that the cooked food you patronize may be prepared under poor hygienic conditions? Well, a group of researchers at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology have identified several fraudulent practices of food vendors in the Kumasi metropolis that pose health threat to consumers. In one of their findings, they say large quantities of food left unsold overnight are usually mixed with fresh batch even when spoilage sets in. Now, the researchers also discovered that vendors use food to establish friendships and alliances with regulators, compromising their ability to enforce laws. This is a report by Mahmoud Mohammed Nuruddin. Many people in big cities depend mostly on cooked food from eateries almost every day because they find it convenient. We realize that for the, for the way they store the, the pounding utensil, the mortar and the pestle, they don't wash it well and it's no good. So by the time they pound the food, they don't pound in small quantities, in large quantities. And within two hours, it starts getting mushy and foamy, means a sign of spoilage. But instead of vendors to throw that one away, what we do is that they pound some more and mix up with it, and then they sell it to unsuspecting customers. So when you come, they just sell those ones to you. And we also realized that the people had high levels of staphylococcus. And in fact, when you eat staphylococcus in the food, you have what the effect is boils. You get boils on the skin. How many of us will eat uh, tea balls on our skin and think it's from the food that we have consumed? According to the research, soups were prepared all night, left partly covered, hence were exposed to pests such as rodents and cockroaches. Lead researcher Gloria Cabrio also explained how vegetables were handled unhygienically, posing threat to consumers. So we'll be back with some stories making headlines on the international front. Let's do more of our stories. More support continues to pour in for 16-year-old Andy Dodu, who suffered severe acid burns. Andy was bathed in acid by his father's tenant over a disagreement. Many corporate bodies and individuals, including the former president, Jerry John Rawlings, have responded positively to calls for support. Latest to donate is coming clothing lines. Chief Executive Godfrey Owusu and Safwa said they were moved by Andy's plight. Watching Andy's feature on Joy News and I actually saw it on Facebook and I followed up to watch it on Joy News. It was really heartbreaking and I felt this is a project we can also work on and then help support our brother. So we put word out and we are able to gather something small to present to Andy. So we are hoping that he will get better soon, even though their finances and everything is good. I think psychological and then a lot of support is needed to make him feel better because looking at how the situation is, is you really need a lot of heart to be able to withstand this. So we are only asking that people will still keep on supporting Andy morally, anything possible to make him feel better. Andy, who is currently responding well to treatment, managed to utter a few words of gratitude. Andy, how are you? How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Today I can feel that I'm very healthy. You can, today you can feel what? I feel healthy. I feel healthy, yes. So Andy, what would you say to people who are giving out to you? I really thank them, seriously. I know you can expect that they will do something. Thank you, I really thank them, seriously. Because they've uh, even like supplying me things, medicine, 
money and some stuff, and many things, plenty, plenty. I want to thank them very serious. I want to thank them. I thank God bless them too. I thank and give them more life to stay on earth. Well, Andy still needs more support to cater for the rest of his medical bills. No amount is too small. Let's do more. The Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has commissioned a multi-purpose printing house to supply its stationery and test books. The facility is also hoping to secure government contracts to print school test books and other supplies. Their chairman of the University Council, Kwame Sarah Mensa, together with the Vice Chancellor, Professor William Otu Ellis, commissioned the six million city facility. Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin has filed this report. The facility was funded from the university printing press internally generated funds. It has placed the university in the lead in printing in the northern sector of the country. The facility has modern equipment including a 746 color unit for production and for post-press purposes a folder machine, a programmable digital guillotine, a Eurobind 600 perfect binder, a UV vanisher, an illuminating machine. The new machines are to augment the existing ones, to strategically take care of the three major areas, as I've already said, production, pre-press, and then uh, post-press. And this makes UPK a one-stop uh, printing, printing shop. Mr. Chairman, I want to take this opportunity to state that UPK is the first printing house in Ghana to generate and produce MCQ scannable forms. The facility will also focus on book publishing to assist authors, the general public and lecturers who engage in self-publishing to upgrade and package their lecture notes into proper books in accordance with internationally accepted standards. Uh, obviously a major step forward in your effort to continue with the rebranding of the press and also serve the university community and in fact all your clients better. It is my hope that these new, these new initiatives will also be a confirmation of your fresh beginnings and therefore taking academic printing into new realms. What we are about to witness today also symbolizes your determination to use the very best technology we can find in any part of the world to do a better job for your customers, including more attractive designs, fewer delays and faster delivery, and ultimately, better quality output. Staff at the facility have been urged to treat us business entity and not the usual government job that receives little attention. If you just joined us, this is Joy News Prime. We'll be back with the entertainment segment. Guess who is here? Miss G is here with your favorite entertainment segment. Miss G. Hello, Aisha. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good okay. to see you. Good to see you too, Aisha. Yes. Okay, so I start on a sad note then. After that, we get to enjoy ourselves. Oh. You know that the, the body of um, the late Neo Dwayne Mensa was set to arrive in yes. Ghana. Yes, you know that the president has assured his family that uh, he was going to foot all the bills and get the body here for us. Yes, that promise has been honored. And so the body would arrive in Ghana on Saturday, which is oh. tomorrow. And so we put this together for you. The mortal remains of the late veteran actor Neo Dray Mensah will arrive in Ghana on Saturday. The body of the actor, according to Joy News, will arrive from China aboard an Ethiopian airline flight. Neo Dray Mensah, who was a former president of the Ghana Actors Guild, passed away Tuesday, April 12th, in China, where he had gone for a kidney transplant. Rumor that his family needed $68,000 to bring the mortal remains of the late actor back home have been dismissed by the family. President John Dramani Mahama promised 
promise to do whatever it takes to ensure the body of the late president of the Ghana Actors Guild is flown home for burial. The president's intention was revealed by the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Creative Arts, Madame Elizabeth Ofusuejeri, when she visited the family of the late actor. She was in company of some members of the Ghana Actors Guild at the Actors Greater Estate Residence in Accra on Monday. According to the minister, the president described Neodre Mensa as a friend and will do his best to help the family in their time of need. Joy News gathers that the family of the late actor will be joined by the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Creative Arts and some members of the Ghana Actors Guild to welcome the body of the late actor at the Kotoka International Airport. Gary Al Smith is here with all the latest from the sports world. Gary, what's up? What's up with Kotoko and Hats? Yeah, it's on Monday and we are building up to the big game. Thankfully, it's on a holiday as well. So, I mean, it will be, it's will it be, be good. fabulous or phobia? Well, the thing is, the great thing is that, um, unlike most times when it's on a weekend or something, it's a holiday. It's a holiday. You know, people say that a lot of places in town are choked. Yes. There are too many people around there. But the stadium is big. It can't be true. It can't be true. So you could go there, and they are trying to market it as a family-oriented event. Uh, event. So, okay. yeah, you could pass by the ticket rate at 10, 12, 15 cities. So, I hey, think why it's not? Food. Even, yeah. even if you don't understand the football, <laughs> you just go and watch and shout and get And, and make noise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's see what's coming up. <laughs> okay, so ahead of the game, we have three days to go. Where does your support lie? Or are you a neutral? Well... The two teams are camping Heart of Folk are in Akuse near Akusumbo, Kotoko in Kumase. And ahead of the tie, Hearts board member Frank Nelson says he's cautiously optimistic of a victory over the Reds in the Super Clash on Monday. The victory for Akras of Folk, but saying that again, uh, it's always a team that everybody plays with 11 players. We need to tread cautiously. Kotoko are not just any other club. You know, Akras of Folk and Kotoko is not just uh, 11 players, but who has the strength, who has what it takes, who is, has the psychological advantage, and I believe that is important. So we are on top of the league by, I mean, behind the league leaders, uh, all star, but we are not too far from them. And Kotoko is not too far from us again. So we must be cautious and know that the three points is important for Kotoko and it's important for Akras. But I just have to tell Kotoko that these three points, they should forget about it. I mean, Opokunti is my brother. I know he needs the three points. So I'll just tell him, maybe look somewhere else to get the three points. But for this time, let Akras use it for a May victory and then, you know, take the three points and add to our kitty. So that's where we, we part company. For more news, join us on myjoyonline.com. And that's where we draw the curtains. My name is Aisha Bryan. Have a great evening.